Germany, August 1939. Adolf Hitler, dictator of the Third Reich, meets with the most important members of the National Socialist Party and the high command of the German armed forces. There, he finalizes the details of the invasion of Poland, which is planned to begin the following month. As we all know, this was the military operation that triggered World War II, the most traumatic and bloody conflict of the 20th century. Although Hitler doesn't know what the outcome of the invasion of Poland will be, he is willing to drag Germany into a war to fulfill his objectives. The Fuhrer dreams of a Europe subjected to his designs and completely integrated into the Nazi empire. And he doesn't mind shedding the blood of his compatriots to achieve it. Tight. At the end of the meeting, the dictator bids farewell to those present, steps out onto the street and walks to his private car. Just at that moment, the car is blown up and the Fuhrer is engulfed in a terrible explosion. With this, the plans for the invasion of Poland are postponed indefinitely. You'll know better than anyone that this story never existed. But today, in this new episode, we'll tell you how the world would be if World War II had never happened. For this exercise in alternate history, let's imagine that, as we were telling you at the beginning of this video, Hitler is assassinated in August 1939, just before launching the invasion of Poland. It's enough to suppose that a group of army officers disagrees with the Fuhrer's plans to start a large-scale war. All the measures taken by the dictator, including the annexation of territories like Austria or parts of Czechoslovakia, were leading towards unleashing a conflict. At this point, the war seems inevitable, but this doesn't mean that the entirety of the German armed forces is in favor of it. In our timeline, some members of the Wehrmacht conspire to eliminate Hitler. They know the plot must be kept secret. If it's revealed, they'll be executed. They also don't want to risk a coup d'etat since they're not sure of their ability to defeat the Nazi assault troops. For this reason, they decide to plant a bomb in the Fuhrer's car and take advantage of the ensuing confusion to seize power. With the dictator dead, the Third Reich has lost its supreme leader and is headless. In the first hours after the attack, chaos and anarchy reign. The hierarchs of the National Socialist Party don't know how to react. The first thing they do is accuse the Communists, the Soviet Union, and the Jews of orchestrating the assassination. However, very soon the question arises of who will take Hitler's place. A new Fuhrer is needed to guide Germany's destiny. This drives a brutal power struggle within the Nazi movement. Joseph Goebbels, Heinrich Himmler, Hermann Göring, Martin Bormann, all of them are convinced they are the legitimate heirs of the deceased dictator. Each one issues press releases and gives inflammatory speeches accusing their comrades of being the architects of Hitler's murder. Discontent in society is enormous and the streets are in a state of agitation. Germany, which until recently seemed ready to launch itself into world conquest, is now on the brink of civil war. Taking advantage of this context, the Wehrmacht officers who killed the Fuhrer move on to the next stage of their master plan. Just a week after the assassination that claimed Hitler's life, the Third Reich Army announces that it will take charge of the country and the National Socialist Party is ousted from government. It is a full-blown coup d'etat, but the Nazi hierarchs are so absorbed in their power struggle that they fail to stop it. Thus, those who sought to be Hitler's heirs are arrested and imprisoned in maximum security prisons. 
The Wehrmacht announces that, once the situation is stabilized, they will be tried for treason and executed. The new authorities of Germany have no intentions of invading Poland or starting a war. Thus, World War II never erupts and the world's history changes completely. For starters, millions of people who would have been enlisted to fight on the battlefield retain their lives. Additionally, no city is ravaged in air bombing campaigns preserving the continent's infrastructure. In such a scenario, we can imagine that Great Britain manages to maintain its position as the world's foremost power. It doesn't need to invest monstrous sums of money in its military, since it's evident that the German government intends to maintain peace. The British no longer have to worry about defending their country, so they can focus on doing business and trading with the rest of the world. While independence movements arise in their colonies in Africa and Asia, the British authorities firmly oppose them and defeat them through arms or diplomacy. As none of their domains become autonomous, England can continue to benefit from the resources and raw materials that it extracts from the colonies, increasing its wealth. Let's see what happens with the United States. Remember that Americans had already experienced the infamous crisis of 1929 when Wall Street crashed. In 1932, Franklin Roosevelt of the Democratic Party was elected president and took the necessary measures to rescue the country and alleviate economic problems. Here's an excerpt from one of his most famous campaign speeches. Give me your help not to win votes alone, but to win in this crusade to restore America to its own people During those years, millions of people were jobless and living on the brink of poverty, desperate not knowing if they would have anything to eat the next day. Thanks to Roosevelt, unemployment began to decrease and the situation finally seemed to improve. However, by 1939 the country was entering a new stage of crisis. In real life, the U.S. economy definitively recovered thanks to its entry into World War II. The conflict positioned Americans as the new world power, displacing Britain from that position. However, in our timeline, the war never erupts, so the country fails to stabilize. Employment levels quickly fall again, and poverty spreads throughout the nation. There are more beggars in the streets, and the social situation becomes overwhelming. Unions constantly strike, and business owners complain they don't have money to pay wages. Everything points to the possibility of a revolution erupting at any moment. In 1940, national elections are held in which Americans vote for a new president. They have to decide whether Roosevelt will remain the president or if they will choose his main opponent, Wendell Wilkie. He was the Republican Party candidate, as well as a significant businessman in the electricity industry and a veteran of World War I. Below, we'll hear one of his actual speeches, where he asserts he will never allow his country to get involved in the fight against Hitler. That I who saw service during the entire period of the last war, and I know what it is to then send men to the shambles of trenches. If you elect me President of the United States, I shall never send an American boy to fight in any European war. But in our timeline, things are different. Roosevelt's poor image and his inability to solve the nation's problems lead to Wilkie winning the elections, becoming the 33rd president of the United States. Despite having many reasons to celebrate, the new leader has no time to enjoy his victory. The crisis is devastating and seems endless. 
Now, the fact that World War II hasn't erupted doesn't mean the world is free from military conflicts. Quite the opposite. Wars will still exist, but they won't have the titanic dimension of the struggle between the Axis and the Allies. In our hypothetical scenario, Japan remains under Emperor Hirohito's rule in a military with fascist tendencies. In 1937, two years before Hitler's death, Japan invaded China with the aim of expanding across Asia, increasing its influence in the region, and seizing its resources. Concurrently, it initiates an occupation campaign in Southeast Asia, conquering various islands in the Pacific Ocean. This is unacceptable to the United States government, which believes that if Japan is not stopped in time, it will soon land on the American West Coast. At this point, history unfolds similarly to how it did in reality. In 1941, President Wendell Wilkie imposes an embargo on oil exports to the Japanese. This meant that the Japanese no longer have the most important raw material of all, which powered their tanks, vehicles, and planes. Without fuel, they couldn't operate their military equipment and therefore couldn't sustain their military plans. Emperor Hirohito authorizes a preventive attack on the U.S. base of Pearl Harbor, located in Hawaii. The maneuver claims the lives of thousands of people, both civilians and military, and is perceived as a treacherous and cowardly act. It's a way to threaten Americans and show them what they are capable of. In our version, Wilkie declares war on the empire with Congress's support initiating a bloody and brutal conflict that will cost both countries dearly. The United States faces the Japanese alone since the Allies do not exist. Great Britain and France see no reason to enter the conflict. Joining a foreign war would only generate discontent among their citizens. On the other hand, the Soviet Union observes with concern the fall of China into the hands of Japan because Japanese conquest ambitions could lead them to Russian territory. However, Emperor Hirohito is astute enough to negotiate a non-aggression treaty with the communists. Thanks to this, he ensures he is not fighting against both the Americans and the Soviets at the same time, allowing him to concentrate all his forces in Southeast Asia. While the Pacific is stained with blood, let's see what happens in Europe. Remember that although Hitler is dead and the main Nazi leaders are under arrest, fascism has not disappeared. Benito Mussolini continues to rule Italy with an iron hand, and although he no longer has his main partner, the German dictator, he still stands firm in his totalitarian ideas. Il Duce's dream is to restore the glory of his nation, turning it into a powerful empire, as in the ancient times of the Romans. For this reason, in 1940, he invades Greece and Yugoslavia, confident that his army has enough power to achieve quick victories and subdue both countries. However, this turns out to be a serious mistake since the Italian armed forces are not capable of conducting such a large-scale military operation. As if Mussolini's troops' ineffectiveness were not enough, another problem arises. The British and the French provide financial aid to Greece and Yugoslavia, allowing them to buy tanks, planes, and weaponry to effectively resist the invasion. Thus, the European powers ensure that fascism does not spread without directly confronting it. By 1942, just two years after the war began, Il Duce's army suffers a humiliating defeat from which it never recovers. It's a catastrophe that forces the dictator to resign from his position because his public image has plummeted and no one supports him. Gradually, Italy becomes a democratic country with freedom of expression and free elections. The fascist party no longer governs the nation and will never do so again. As for Mussolini, 
One day, he is intercepted by the partisans, who did everything possible to overthrow him during his dictatorship. Just as happened in reality, Il Duce is shot, and his corpse is displayed in public for people to throw stones at. An immense crowd in Milan jams the public square where the bodies of Mussolini, fellow fascist, and his mistress are displayed. Executed by Patriot partisan forces when caught trying to escape from Italy, the degraded Duce is spurned in death by raging people at the place from which he launched the march on Rome. Returning to the Pacific, the war between the United States and Japan ends around 1945, after almost four years of blood and fire. After enormous effort, victory belongs to the Americans. It's a bitter triumph as hundreds of thousands of soldiers and millions of dollars in military equipment were lost. The Americans do not emerge from the conflict as a powerful nation, but as a normal country, which in terms of wealth still lags behind Great Britain, the major player on the international stage. As you can see, if the conflict between the Allies and the Axis had not existed, history would be completely different. By 1945, there would have been two powers, England and the Soviet Union. It's most likely that, from then on, the world would have been dominated by a new conflict, a kind of Cold War similar to the one that actually happened. In this case, the adversaries would have been the British and the Russians. But this is a topic for another video. We've reached the end of the video and we'd like to ask you, how do you think the world would be if World War II had not happened? Leave us your answer in the comment section below. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel to learn about many more military events that have left their mark on history.